And now we do indeed jump into the first part of this agenda, which is a virtual signing ceremony. It took us quite some time to figure out how to do it of the request to adapt European energy planning scenarios. And I will be passing on the word to this lady, Antonella Battaglini, CEO of the Renewables Grid Initiative, to explain to us why this request, what it's the story, why do we need it, and also who do, did you bring with, a, with you um, to support your messages, ideally. Antonella, the floor is yours, but you tell me when I shall click to the next slide for you. Okay, thank you, Valentina, and welcome everybody into this virtual meeting. It is actually our first big meeting of this sort, and I'm really excited to see how it works. Um, if you put on the next slide, Tina, I will briefly introduce RGI. Um, RGI is an organization that's uh, living in infancy by now because uh, we have already um, past the 10th anniversary. It was set up in 2009, uh, bringing TSOs, transmission system operators, electric transmission system operators, and NGOs to really think uh, what is the infrastructure that we need to um, facilitate and support the energy transition and how do we make sure that the infrastructure that is being built is built in a fast way and without impact in nature and uh, without uh, um, too much opposition. So how do we win the souls and the minds of the people? Um, in the course of these 10 years, we have um, uh, changed a bit our approach uh, from electricity only into a system approach. And so we started to engage with what we believe is an ecosystem of actors. And this request is also um, showing the... Um, Antina, I see you. I don't know whether this is correct, by the way. Um, so the, the request that we are signing today is the reflection of our um, ambition to be more active in the broader um, energy system. Because indeed, uh, the infrastructure that we are going to build is an essential element uh, for the energy transition. So Antina, can you please move to the next slide? Um, what are the key messages of this request? Um, we have been focusing this request on the TYNDP, the 10-year net development plan. Uh, because this is the process at European level that uh, allows for identifying um, electricity and, gra and gas infrastructure requirements. Uh, at this stage, I want to thank ENSO-E in particular for having um, supported this work, uh, the PAC process, uh, um, as a whole, being very keen in listening, but also in uh, um, verifying how certain ideas can be implemented in their planning process. However, the TYNDP, um, we believe, needs to broaden up, needs to be more uh, compatible and coherent with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, in particular, the effort to reach 1.5 degree maximum increase in temperature. And therefore, the request is about asking for uh, support, especially from policies, um, from government, from uh, uh, regulators, to develop uh, uh, scenarios used for modeling with uh, also include a very high share of renewable, a very high degree of electrification, full recognition of decentralized resources, and of course, many other things, including efficiency, the, the role of nature uh, in the site selection and so on. 
Moreover, because the TYNDP is the base for um, selecting the project of common European interest, uh, we think it is essential that the PCI selection is coherent with the long-term climate target. This will support the um, speed up of the infrastructure deployment and also uh, contribute in public support. And now I would like to introduce the two uh, keynote speakers. Uh, I start, next slide please, with Laszlo Barro, he is the Chief Economist of the International Energy Agency. Um, and it will be followed by Claude Tumes, Minister of Energy and Spatial Planning in Luxembourg. Um, I give you both five minutes for intervention. Please, Laszlo, unmute yourself and uh, uh, start your keynote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Antonello, for the kind invitation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so at the International Energy Agency, we assessed the impact of the coronavirus crisis on the energy system in our global energy review. And we estimate uh, that the crisis will lead to a roughly 2.6 billion tons reduction in global carbon dioxide emissions. Now, while uh, this is historically unprecedented, uh, what we also need to reflect on is that uh, uh, in the IE sustainable development scenario, which is the mathematical representation of the Paris Agreement, Global carbon dioxide emissions become lower than today uh, by 2025, only five years from now. Uh, and next time, we will want to achieve that without shutting down the global economy. So we still have a major energy transition task ahead. And there's a tendency to talk about a clean energy technological revolution. Unfortunately, in the broad sense of the word, this is not true. Uh, the, in our tracking clean energy progress exercise, uh, we found the majority of potential clean energy technologies being off track, getting a yellow or even a red light. Uh, and there is indeed a transformative revolutionary technological progress in a narrow group of technologies, primarily wind power, solar photovoltaic, and electricity storage technologies. And this is very important to keep in mind that the transition to low carbon energy system is not going to be done in a copy paste fashion. We could envisage a transition, and in fact, that, that height was envisaged 20 years ago, that we replace uh, base load coal-fired power plants with base load nuclear power plants and we replace oil with biofuels. That would be a copy-paste transition. But instead, we are going to have a transition which will involve a very deep transformation of the energy system, with a much higher degree of electrification of the economy, taking advantage of the successfully advancing low carbon electricity production, and transforming the power system to very high shares of wind and solar power. Please note that I'm not using the 100% number because there will be European countries who will want to keep nuclear power in the energy mix. And, there, and also, I do think that geothermal heat or biogas will continue to play a useful role. Uh, so, but let's not get too ideological about the 100% number because the measures, the investments, the innovation that we have to take for an 82% renewable share is not very different from 100% uh, one. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that the share of wind and solar will have to very significantly increase. There is absolutely no doubt that the energy system will have to be much more strongly electrified. And unfortunately, there is also absolutely no doubt that our current energy infrastructure is not prepared for the task, and there is a major work to do. Uh, in fact, we have uh, detected in our investment uh, report series that even before the coronavirus crisis, globally, the electricity network was, uh, was suffering from systematic underinvestment. The coronavirus crisis hit electricity networks hard, but even before the coronavirus crisis, global network investment has been declining. And this is a major concern because the large majority of renewable deployment is utility scale and requires an interconnected network. Uh, so there is a work to be done in the electricity network, and I believe that there are three main tasks. First is physical investment. They have to build a better infrastructure, and they have to make investments at the high end of the network and in the low end of the, ne low end of the network. The high end of the network investment would be building electricity superhighways uh, to, to, to be able to transport large quantities of renewable electricity from regions like offshore in the North Sea, where the natural conditions are favorable to the main consumption centers. 
And I have to tell you that every time in a European context that I mentioned, the potential for direct current ultra high voltage transmission, I typically get the answer that yes, but this is not China. Um, now, actually, the longest and most impressive direct current transmission project is not in China, it's in Brazil, which has a democratic political system. Uh, and, and I think that our discussions are giving up too easily uh, on transmission development. Uh, we also need to invest in the low end of the network, reinforcing and modernizing and smartening the distribution system to handle electric cards and residential solar plants. But in addition to financial capital, we also need to invest uh, uh, regulatory efforts and political efforts to improve the regulatory systems, improve the market design and licensing environment. And last but, last but not least, we will also need technological innovation, uh, especially uh, solving problems with power electronics innovation of maintaining grid stability at ultra high shares of wind and solar production. Uh, so all of these uh, are important parts of the energy transition. Now, in this respect, I believe long-term scenario planning plays a very important role. Uh, the role of long-term scenarios is not to predict the future. That is by its nature impossible. Its role is to put up a mirror to policymakers, to identify the priorities, to identify the areas where we need to make a stronger effort. So I congratulate the efforts of the Renewable Grid Initiative, and I'm looking forward to cooperate with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laszlo. And now I would like to pass the word to Claude. Claude, I hope you have joined. Yes, I can see. Thanks a lot for uh, being with us today. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Antonella. Uh, and it's a pleasure to speak after, after Laszlo. Uh, so I think we, we have to be aware we are in the age of uh, climate urgency. We have very, very little time uh, to move the show. Uh, and in order to move the show, I think we have to be more radical uh, and above all faster than we have been uh, anywhere over the last 25, 30 years. The first thing is, of course, um, energy efficiency. Uh, so all new buildings should be uh, electricity only. Uh, uh, all, all new cars should uh, be uh, efficient electric cars, buses, and so on. So we need to do a leapfrog in energy efficiency. And this leapfrog will also lead to very high degree of electrification, which is something new. I think also something new for the NGO world and the green world, because we, we I, I would say 10 years ago, we, we basically wanted to have a lot of uh, solar heaters, uh, renewable, but uh, PV costs, wind costs have come down in a way that we now, I think the, the, the way to, to the path to accelerate is really through uh, renewable or green uh, electrification. That means, of course, that uh, one, uh, we will have to uh, deploy solar, wind onshore and wind offshore much faster. At EU level, uh, I think we have a real problem is that EU Commission is not willing to, to go higher on the 2030 renewable targets. I think the only way to, to have a, a, a solid and robust climate urgency path is to, to go much faster on renewables. And then, of course, you need to anticipate what does that mean for the electricity system. And as Laszlo has put it, um, we need really to have uh, I would say four things done. Uh, one is modeling. Uh, modeling is really important because modeling shows you where are potential barriers and, and which you have to anticipate. So uh, I welcome uh, the work which is done uh, under, under this initiative and I deploy that or I, I'm not happy with uh, EU Commission uh, because EU Commission should be uh, running modeling of higher renewable shares in 2030 and of course uh, also in, in 2050 and uh, I think uh, in, in the, uh, the, the Commission is still refusing to have a 100% renewable scenario which is a democratic, a lack of democracy because I think we have, we should also have uh, that, uh, that scenario. And um, climate urgency means also that it's not incremental uh, changes but we need now to design the, the, the end system uh, and uh, I think the challenge for NCOE and all those modeling the electricity system is to have always the latest ambitious uh, ambitions on, on renewables 
For example, we have a 450 gigawatt offshore wind scenario, which is solid, which has been presented by, by Wind Europe. We have uh, gigawatts of solar presented by, by Solar Europe. Uh, we have a new 100% uh, scenario for Europe presented by DIW uh, in, in Germany with this consortium of others. So we need to integrate these high shares into the scenario uh, work. Um, the next thing is then, of course, um, uh, the, the, uh, what, what will, where, where will the stress happen in the grid? I think, and Laszlo has put it, uh, I think, rightly, the, the stress will happen at the local, local level. So, for example, what we are now doing, or what we are trying to do in Luxembourg is, um, when we deploy uh, wall boxes uh, in order to have charge at home, or charge uh, not in an individual house, but also in residences, we try to immediately plan for a maximum of intelligence. So the challenge is not if you have a, a, an apartment house where you can have 20 electric cars in, the challenge is not to have a, a good, a, 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 a full supply of the two first cars. The challenge is to, from the very beginning on, have intelligence in the garage so that all 20 cars, which are possible today, uh, can be switched over to electricity. So it's really this idea that intelligence has to be brought into the local grid from the very beginning of be it on, on heat pumps, on solar, uh, and above all on uh, electromobility. The next thing is, of course, uh, data using uh, big data, using the, the possibilities we have with IT. IT. So what we are doing in Luxembourg is uh, trying to organize a central energy data platform, which will be a public one. Uh, so where we will have very high standards for uh, for the whole uh, data protection, but where we will use uh, the full uh, power of, of IT to, to really anticipate uh, how to manage also in future on a, on a daily uh, price signal system, uh, the electricity flows. Um, the last issue, uh, and that is not an easy issue also in Luxembourg, is we will need some high voltage highways uh, we are confronted in Luxembourg also to upgrade our existing 220, uh, maybe to, to 380. Um, so, and then of course you have to win over uh, the, the, the citizens. Uh, and for that, uh, basically what, what, I, what is my recommendation is one, we should oblige all grid companies to have really, really serious, detailed and transparent modeling. So people have to understand why an infrastructure is needed. Second, uh, in this modeling, all uh, flexibility options have to be fully uh, taken on board. Uh, three is, uh, if a line is necessary, uh, it is held before anything else. So we should not continue to have high voltage lines too close to, to housing. Uh, and then the next is having a bit of a holistic view. So if we build one big new infrastructure, that should also allow us to uh, take down other uh, infrastructure. So in Luxembourg, what we are training to do is there is more lines taken away than new lines uh, built. Uh, and then of course, it's the issue of undergrounding. You cannot do it everywhere, but this should be uh, prioritized. And if we have a line, then I think we need uh, also uh, architects, people who have a, a sense of how to integrate uh, this kind of linear infrastructure into uh, also beautiful landscapes. So, um, Antonella, I don't know uh, where we are in, in, in your organization on that, but I think we need to have um, basically the approach of the high voltage lines is in the, the ones which we build today should be something like land art. I think that, uh, that we can design uh, more uh, beautiful uh, and better integrated uh, mass uh, in order to get this high voltage uh, infrastructure. So that would be my messages and thanks a lot for pushing ANSOE, but also EU Commission and uh, even IEA to, to really have this climate urgency modeling focused on the electricity uh, system. Thank you very much, Claude. And uh, let's be in touch about the pylons because indeed we have been working on that for a long time. And now we move on to the video, the signing ceremony, the virtual signing ceremony of this um, request. 
and hopefully the Commission and national government will indeed embrace a very ambitious scenario. Scenarios are for learning and therefore we should have a very broad range of them. Uh, please start the video. To collaborate, to collaborate with other TSOs, DSOs, with the governments and of course also with NGOs like RGI. European energy planning needs to ensure that we actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions and that we do it in a way that does not destroy nature. This is possible, but it requires good inclusive consultation and proper open transparent planning. We need to reduce CO2 and we therefore need more renewables. That must be reflected in European energy planning processes. And the restart after COVID-19 is probably a unique opportunity to set the new Green Deal up and implement it. Citizens want to be asked how their energy systems of the future look like. Uh, this is why we have signed this declaration. We think it's um, crucial that we get good scenarios which fit to the Paris um, Agreement. We are convinced that energy transition scenarios must be carried out in close cooperation with stakeholders. We signed this request because a comprehensive scenario provides clarity on fact-based opportunities and challenges. My colleague Nigel Topping, the high-level climate action champion for COP26, has signed this request because of the importance of aligning around 1.5 degree compatible pathways, for which a very high share of renewable energy is key. I'm glad to sign this declaration because Europe can and must decarbonize a lot faster than many scenarios assume today. We have been pushing for more renewables, particularly through the electrification of our system. It is crucial that the TY and DP scenarios are fully in line with the one and a half degree targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. So we hope that a lot of organizations will follow our example. So it makes absolute sense that our planning for the development of our electricity networks should be based on a scenario that enables us to deliver that ambitious goal of climate neutrality. Good. Can you hear me? Thanks a lot, um, Antonella. You were meant to see for a little bit longer where you can sign the scenario. Now you can see the beauty of all the organizations that have not the scenario, the request that have signed the request. Um, and we will of course share these links afterwards. And this is not meant to be a definite list. This is meant to be the beginning of a list because we believe that there are many other organizations that may want to um, should support the proposition that this request asks for. Thanks a lot, Antonella. Thanks a lot to Laszlo, who will be back with us again in a little while. And also thanks to Claude, who I believe has had to leave in the meantime. This is the end of part one of our agenda. We start the transition to the second part. And let me say in this transition a few words about the PAC project, which is the umbrella of all we are showing and doing here today, the umbrella uh, under which the request has been developed and also the PAC scenario that we are coming to now. There is a PAC consortium, which consists of the European Environmental Bureau, the Climate Action Network Europe, REN21 and RGI. 
Um, it has received financing from the, from the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. The core tasks of this consortium were to scrutinize and advise TYNDP scenarios for Paris compatibility, to develop the PAC scenario, both of these were the focus of CAN and EEB. RGI has organized modelers exchange workshops focusing on how to model the complexities of a future energy system. There are many of them. Between REN21 and RGI, we share the European and global dissemination task. This has been mentioned before, um, and it's a bit evident out of this list of core tasks. The ENSOs have been very special stakeholders to us in all this. And a special thank you has to go to ENSOE for, as said before by Antonella, their willingness to think differently about the future, but also for their practical support and helping us as the consortium to understand many of the nitty gritties of TYNDP scenarios and supporting with their expertise some of the analytical work that has been done there. Indeed, without uh, this openness of NSOE, this project would not have happened. And now we really move on to the launch of the PAC scenario, which is certainly the most interesting and impressive outcome of this entire project. Actually, when this started, the proposition was to develop a storyline, not an entire quantified scenario. But come Europe and the European Environmental Bureau said, no, for us, that this really makes sense, it has to be a quantified scenario. So they, together with their member networks, um, started to build a scenario. Please understand it as the suggestion by civil society. This is what makes it so special. It's a civil society built scenario. It's their suggestion on how to make what the request, request broadly asks for, how to make it specific and concrete. And with this, let me introduce to you as first speakers, Patrick Kenbrink, Director of EU Policy of the European Environmental Bureau, and Wendel Trio, Director of the Climate Action Network Europe, who will start with explaining to us how the genesis of this scenario makes it so special and different from other scenarios with very high shares of renewables that, of course, have been developed in the past. I can see Wendel, I cannot see Patrick yet. If someone could activate Patrick's video or Patrick activates it himself. And Wendel, you will have to unmute yourself and you will have to tell me next slide, please. Okay. Thank you, Antina. So, um, uh, welcome everybody. Just to be clear, this project um, and this scenario in particular started from the Paris Agreement that was uh, adopted in December of 2015. And as you probably all know, one of the key elements of the Paris Agreement is that countries collectively agreed to make an effort to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And by doing so, um, countries also very explicitly said, we are setting this target of 1.5 degrees Celsius because moving beyond that limit will bring um, radical impacts to our society. And those radical impacts we are already witnessing even while we're around one degree at the moment. Um, it's, it seems like far away, but we had forest fires in Australia that had damaging impacts um, not more than, than a year ago. And we had similar forest fires in Europe, and we might see some of them again uh, during the summer as we're heading towards another uh, draft uh, disaster in Europe. We've, of course, continued to witness um, hurricanes and cyclones, in particular impacting those who are most vulnerable to climate change and often who have least participated in it. And we've, for instance, seen um, incredible economic damages, 12 billion euro economic damages due to climate change in Europe in 2017 alone. So in one year, 12 billion that got lost because of climate change just at one degree. And so 1.5 will be much, much more heavily. And despite that kind of collective agreement, countries, individuals brought, individual countries brought commitments to Paris that did not match with that collective uh, target. Instead, it was calculated by the UN that the current pledges that countries made, including the EU's uh, 
at least 40% emission reductions by 2030 target would bring us towards at least three degrees of warming during this century and probably more, depending on whether these commitments would be implemented. So it's very clear that what we're currently planning to do is not enough. And based on the 1.5 degrees target of the Paris Agreement, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made a special report on global warming of 1.5. And similarly, United Nations Environment Programme uh, made, uh, in the meantime, its ninth or tenth edition of the Emissions Gap Report, which they published last year. And there are two, three main messages from these two critical scientific reports. One is if we are to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, we will need unprecedented action. We will need unprecedented action. Secondly, um, if we are to limit temperature rise to 1.5, we need global emissions to go net zero to climate neutrality by the middle of the century. And three, more importantly even, is to take action in the very short term. And uh, in particular, the UNEP emissions gap report said that if we want to limit temperature rise to 1.5, we need to reduce um, emissions on an annual basis by 7.6% per year between 2021 and 2030. Based on all of that, NGOs taken on board both the science input as well as equity considerations, we have been calling for the EU to um, reach climate neutrality already by 2040 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 65% by 2030 and to do all of that in a sustainable way. Um, next slide. Now, when NGOs make these kind of statements, people say, oh, they're very challenging, et cetera, et cetera, but how are we going to do that? And that is the challenge that we took upon us as part of this uh, PAC project, is to look at, okay, we need this kind of very un unprecedented change, but how will we do that in Europe and how will we transform the energy system? And we've looked at the number of studies that are already available on, um, on the market, let's say, including studies from Fraunhofer, London School of Economics, the Lutte University in Finland, uh, Technical University in Berlin, etc. Uh, next slide. And we brought all of those um, information together at um, a number of workshops that we organized with our broad membership. And we have over uh, collectively both European Environment Bureau and Can Europe, we have about over 200 members. We brought them together with experts, scientists, people from uh, different industry federations and so on. And we actually constructed um, the PAC scenario based on a collective input from all of that expertise um, and based on the desire to achieve net zero emissions by 2040 and minus 65% by 2030. And the positive thing is what we found is it is possible. It is actually possible to develop scenarios that are in line with the huge ask that is upon us to limit temperature rise to 1.5 and still stay within sustainable sustainability limits. And that's actually what we want to present, but I'll give now the floor to Patrick. Okay, thank you very much, Wendel. I don't know if my video is visible now. Can you see me? Okay, great. No, thanks very much. I'll be talking later on, on some sort of policy implications, so um, I'll keep this part short because I'll come back again later. But I just wanted to underline, well, first of all, thank all of our members and experts for engaging in this because it has been quite an intensive process over the last, the last year. I wanted to underline one point that this is not an ideological position at all. This is, this is simply a science-based, evidence-based, and consult consultation-based effort to develop a scenario that fits in with the commitments of achieving the 1.5 degrees. So I think that's possible, and that's, that's the basis of it. Um, and also, it's, 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 we're not the only ones asking for this. Uh, Austria, Denmark, Ireland, Lithuania, Luxembourg, and Spain have all called upon the Commission to include a 100% renewable scenario. 
in their projections. So what we're hoping to do with this, this scenario is to show what we think is a way forward. And Jonathan York will come up with the, with the details on that. And then say, well, okay, this is our picture. What does it actually imply? What does it imply for policy making? Um, what does it imply for investment and so on and so forth? So the key, the key point here is that what we're trying to do is an evidence-based issue, non-ideological. We think it's possible. We've proved it's possible. And now let's explore what it means. And then, of course, there will be barriers and drivers and enablers. And that will be important for us to collectively in this wider group explore how to actually realize this scenario. So I'll leave it there for the moment and I'll come back again later. Thanks. Thanks to the two of you for this overview. Uh, as a side note, we hear that in comparison to the last round, the quality and quantity of feedback to the TYNDP scenario, draft scenario consultation of the ENSOs has visibly increased slash improved. And we believe this is strongly related to the work we have done here as well. Uh, we are almost at the scenario itself. I promised I would tell you how we do the Q&A with a bit more detail. If you have not done so yet, get this link. You can copy it out of the chat. If you have two screens, you may want to open it on your computer. Otherwise, an extra mobile device may be more helpful. What you can do when you open this is you can ask questions and rank questions of others. So you perhaps you probably will be asked to enter your name. Please do so. Click continue. The name is not going to be shown again, though. You may be seeing a waiting room, but probably you just end directly in something that looks like this screen. Put your questions in here, submit under the submit button. If you see a question down there where you say awesome, click on the thumb up. And if you say not so interesting, click on the thumb down. You can sort this list by newly incoming questions or always the highest ranked questions on top. We open this now. The Q&A will start officially after the presentation of the two gentlemen that I'm introducing now, which have spent a significant amount of their lifetime over the past months on working on the scenario. Welcome to Jörg Mühlenhoff, Energy Scenarios Coordinator, Climate Action Network Europe. Uh, Jörg, please turn on your video. And welcome to Jonathan Bonadio, Policy Officer for Renewables, Climate and Grids at the European Environmental Bureau. Jörg, you take over the screen sharing and uh, let's go into the details of the PAC scenario. Okay, hello, good morning. I'm Jonathan Bonadio from the European Environmental Bureau. Thanks indeed, uh, Antina. Thanks to Vandal uh, and Patrick for the introduction of the Paxlayo. I hope you can all see me and hear me well. Um, so I have been working together with uh, Jörg Mullenhoff uh, from Can Europe on the building of the Paxlayo. I owe myself in this introduction also to thanks uh, warmly all the people, members, stakeholders, experts, etc., academics. I mean, the list is pretty long of people who contributed to building this uh, PAC scenario uh, and building the assumptions. So without further ado, I'm gonna briefly introduce one of the most uh, exciting questions of this presentation is, how did we do to build this PAC scenario, this Paris Agreement compatible scenario? As you can see in the slide here, it's been pretty uh, simple a question and pretty complex an answer. We started with the first question, which is, how much energy will the European Union uh, need in the future? So reflected and based upon uh, more than 60 studies and uh, science and sources, we built what would the uh, energy demand, the consumption of energy would, like, uh, would look like in the future with also the input of member. Then we ask ourselves when we have built this, this uh, forward-looking energy consumption, the evolution of the consumption, we ask ourselves, another question is where will all this energy come from and this is where where once again based upon the studies and discussion with stakeholders we try to to build uh, we build this um, sustainable fully renewable energy system uh, to match um, the demand uh, what we did in this scenario in this first step the, the overall philosophy of building the scenario uh, is really about having a balance between uh, how we produce energy and how we consume energy on a yearly basis to have the sufficient amount of energy for our yearly consumption. Uh, 
based on this, of course, our guiding principle, where, as Kanjong has presented, uh, the uh, climate and energy targets in renewables, greenhouse gas reduction, and energy efficiency gains. And we checked the overall scenario afterwards towards these targets by 2030 and 2050 uh, in order to see if it indeed matches our, uh, our goal of the Paris Agreement. As it was said before, I mean, I think it's important. It was not an ideological build at first. It was really a, uh, a, um, a way to answer the question, is it actually possible to have a swift uh, transition to 100% renewables and to match uh, the, 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 the demands of the, uh, of the Paris Agreement of the IPCC uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emission with the vision, of course, integrating the vision of civil society. So, and last but not least, there was one important point, Jörg will introduce it afterwards. We also want it, once we ask ourselves and reply to the question, is it physically possible, is uh, replying the question, will the line, will the lights, will the heating keep on at every hour uh, of the day with such a renewable scenario? Jörg will present you the results. Uh, I don't want to do any spoiler here, uh, but we have a, 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 very, uh, a very good and positive answer to this question as well. Without further ado, a quick overview on um, the first question that we ask on the next slide, indeed, uh, th thanks Jörg, which is how much energy uh, will we need? I, I don't want to go into the details, Jörg will introduce the sectors afterwards, but the core message from the uh, PAC scenario building is that we can have, we can divide by two our energy demand between now and 2050, uh, thanks to energy efficiency measures, thanks to um, lower demand, uh, thanks to uh, optimization of processes, thanks to electrification of, of, uh, of sectors, and then we'll present you the sectors afterwards. Um, now, uh, in the next slide, uh, to go a bit more in details, because you might all ask, well, where does all this energy come from if we have a fully renewable system? So, uh, very nice tautology, all energy is renewable. So basically, uh, fossil gas, fossil oil products, and coal uh, would be phased out uh, before 2040, as you can see with a, a, an incremental phase out uh, in this graph. Uh, the core message is, uh, uh, as uh, Claude Turmer said in the, uh, in the introduction, we will need electricity. This is by construction. This is not an ideology. We, 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 when we start the scenario, we, we were quite agnostic towards electricity as an energy carrier, but we have to witness that when we phase out fossil fuels, we need extra energy supply from renewable electricity, also for heat from heat pumps, and also a bit uh, for flexibility in some sectors from uh, non-fossil gases else, and fuels such as hydrogen. Voila, I think it was a nice, a nice teasing. Uh, I, will, uh, I will let your complete and go into a bit of deeper analysis of the sectors and how the demand for sectors was involved. Thanks indeed, and you're, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for this introduction and good morning also from my side. Um, let me now um, guide you through the distinct sectors um, that we assess together with members and experts. First of all, uh, most important sector is of course industry. In the industry sector, the big headline is uh, the circular economy approach. Circular economy means that amongst many other things, we will reduce uh, the material demand, the material demand uh, will change and that leads to a decrease in energy consumption. Uh, we are mainly based here on the findings of the material economic study that was published last year. We took over uh, many of their assumptions and data and we also assume that many uh, production processes in industry actually can be electrified for those uh, sectors that cannot be electrified with renewable electricity for example, in the steel industry where high temperatures are needed, we assume that renewable hydrogen will be introduced in these specific industry sectors. Now, when we look to uh, the buildings we are living in, uh, the picture is completely different. Uh, in the residential sector, the big headline is the deep renovation wave. The deep renovation wave means that while we are currently only renovating 1% of the building stock in Europe per year, we will and can um, increase this share to 3% per year. 
uh, based on findings of the EU CALC project and of Fraunhofer ISI study uh, that we introduced into our scenario building process. Um, this deep renovation wave is not only an opportunity to um, reduce the energy demand of the buildings we are living in, it is also an opportunity to uh, replace uh, the inefficient fossil uh, fuel boilers in our homes with more efficient electric heat pumps or with a connection to a district heat network that would uh, then bring the renewable heat to the houses. Uh, when it comes to um, the office buildings, to public buildings, the buildings we are working in, in the tertiary sector, the same principles apply. You see more or less the same trends based on these assumptions, uh, with the difference that the electricity uh, share here is higher because of the higher importance of the information and communication technologies in office buildings. Let me briefly introduce you to uh, the smallest sector in terms of energy demand, which is the agriculture sector. In the agriculture sector, the big headline is a switch from fossil oil products that are used in farming machinery and other processes to renewable electricity and mainly bioenergy, which in the case of agriculture is just uh, a circular use of residues of byproducts that anyway occur in agriculture so we can harvest an important bioenergy potential uh, without questioning sustainability criteria that we also discussed. Um, I will hand over for the last sector for the transport sector to Jonathan again. Thanks indeed Jörg. So a uh, very brief overview of the transport sector because I think this is a very important big picture second energy consumer after energy production. Uh, this is a core sector and also challenging to uh, to abate and to uh, and to, 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 tra to transform into fully renewable. Uh, the big lesson from the transport is that if we want to match our targets and our goals, Paris Agreement compatible and uh, net zero 2040, we need to move from 90% uh, fossil fuel driven uh, consumption into a fully renewable in 20 years. This is we are aware. Of the, of the challenge which is behind this. And therefore, we assume in the PAC scenario, and I think it was an important philosophy of the whole PAC scenario beyond transport, we try to use as much as possible existing viable and proven technologies. Uh, and in the field of transport, um, the most efficient way to decarbonize a sector which is heavily reliant on, on combustion engines, on fossil fuels, 90%, was through electrification. With batteries for individual vehicles, for passengers, potentially with e-highways, catenary airlines, with a model shift to train for freight, uh, and with uh, for sectors which are the more difficult to decarbonize, long distance shipping, long distance freight, heavy freight, and uh, aviation, uh, we can think indeed of non-fossil fuels. There is one important question which I allow myself to answer, um, anticipate some questions. Uh, also the philosophy of the PAC scenario was to keep in a way the same level of a comparable level of services, uh, energy services than the current uh, system, which means that um, let's say that uh, the, the, we keep the same temperature in houses, we keep basically comparable distance with, of course, model shift, but we try to keep the same level of services for avail because data were more available and also because we wanted to show that it is possible to actually uh, switch to fully renewable while keeping more or less the same level of energy services. So voila, this is the bigger le lesson of transport. It's possible to, with indeed a high electrification. Of course, there are a lot of details I'm happy to discuss afterwards. Thanks indeed, and I'll leave the floor to you again. Yes, and uh, as you have seen in all these uh, sector-specific charts that we presented, the blue slice uh, for electricity is quite important. You might ask yourself now, how much electricity actually do we need and where will it come from? Um, with regards to the electricity mix, um, very clearly we have to first double the electricity generation to feed the electrolyzers that will produce renewable hydrogen. Um, and also to charge, uh, for example, the batteries of the electric vehicles. 
Um, but this is feasible to double the generation between 2015 and 50 because we can tap our own domestic European solar and wind potentials easily as the cheapest source of uh, electricity. You will ask yourself also, well, with an energy system that is based on a very high share of renewables that depend on the weather, is this system still stable? Will it work? Um, for this reason, we fed our numbers into an electricity market model uh, run by Eco Institute. Um, and the good news about this is that uh, all the additional demand that I just mentioned, for example, the batteries, the electrolyzers, uh, they will be also a flexible demand. They will function as a flexibility option in our future uh, energy system. Um, so, um, when you look into the results, into the future, as uh, Laszlo Varro from uh, IEA just mentioned in the beginning, it is not just a copy-paste exercise, this switch towards a renewable energy system. Um, we need much more flexibility. And this flexibility, I will guide you through uh, those flexibility options. It will make sure that we can keep the lights on and the houses warm. Uh, I will guide you clockwise through these uh, different flexibility options. First of all, of course, around wind and solar, we will have uh, fossil uh, capacities that still will run in the future, but they will reduce uh, their electricity output in order to avoid that grids will be congested. Um, the grids anyway, of course, will have to be expanded um, on a cross-border level, but also in particular on the distribution grid level. And we can use this uh, infrastructure in a much more efficient way. Whenever the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing, there are of course other renewable energy sources that can fill the gap in that case, like biogas or hydrocore. And likewise, consumers, be it households or industry, also will ramp up or ramp down in a flexible way their specific energy demand. And of course, they will need to be rewarded for that and get the right signal at the right moment in time to ease the infrastructure. Last but not least, uh, storage is very important. It's key in this PEC scenario that we ramp up massively the capacity of solar PV prosumer batteries and also flexible electrolyzers that will absorb the excess renewable electricity. Um, so this is the picture of uh, our future system built around flexibility. Uh, there are many options that are already in use. This is a conservative approach, science-based. We mainly rely on technologies that are already introduced into markets that are major, that, it, that we can scale up immediately. Let me summarize. So uh, you see here now our Paris Agreement compatible energy scenario that is our pathway uh, for Europe uh, to be compatible with the Paris Agreement towards net zero emissions by 2014, a 100% renewable energy system. Uh, to the businesses, we uh, suggest you to read this scenario also as an investment plan for the green recovery. And regarding policymakers and grid operators, please also consider these elements as the guiding elements for energy infrastructure planning in the future. Thank you very much. We, of course, are looking forward uh, now also to answer to your questions. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. Jörg for this very insightful presentation. Some of you in the audience will say, I need to look at the scenario again straight away, it's online. If you go to the PAC web page and scenario development, you can find all the details. Those of you who are generally very much into scenarios, let me share that there's also a couple of high rest uh, interesting scenarios that have been developed by TSOs that uh, you can uh, find a link to as well online or reach out to us in case you are interested. We have had quite a bit of activity starting already in the poll everywhere. Um, and I will just get going and asking questions to the two of you. Uh, we may have to shorten the time a tiny little bit. You guys were super punctual. Beforehand, we had some uh, more flexibility in the interpretation of the watch. The highest ranking question, as far as I've seen, is actually not even phrased as a question. Uh, there is the yeah, proposition that uh, TYNDP scenarios are already Paris Agreement compatible. Can you explain how your PAC scenario is different and really Paris Agreement compatible and where your concerns lie 
with the scenarios that are in the TUI NDP. Um, shoot up a hand if one of you wants to go first. Otherwise, I have to pick and I would say Jack. Yes, thank you for this question. So uh, the difference of uh, our PEC scenario um, with regards to existing official scenarios like the European Commission's long-term strategy published in 2018 or the current 10-year network development plan scenarios, um, they, the big difference is that, of course, this scenario is much faster. As Claude Thomas uh, initially said, we have to be much faster to be in line. And Wendel also explained uh, that um, the United Nations uh, Environmental Programme in their emission gap report also tells us that we have to ramp up ambition and be uh, more speedy with regards to uh, reducing our emissions. There is another big difference, um, which is also relying on technologies. We basically uh, here in our PAC scenario introduce renewable technologies, energy efficiency solutions that are already available that you can ramp up and scale up uh, just now immediately without waiting for uh, technologies that uh, are potentially questionable uh, like carbon capture and storage where we do not yet see a broad market introduction compared to our renewable energy technologies or energy efficiency solutions right now. That is why we suggest indeed to consider these elements and to enrich uh, the current studies like TYNDP scenarios uh, with more variety, with more variation. This is also learning from the consultation process uh, with uh, the grid operators that it would be good uh, to also consider uh, a 1% renewable energy scenario in order to prepare our infrastructure for the future and avoid stranded assets, of course. Super, thanks a lot. Then the next one goes to Jonathan. Jonathan, uh, does the PAC scenario follow the National Energy and Climate Plans? Thanks indeed for the question, Tina. Um, I think the, the, the answer to this question is pretty simple. In a nutshell, the PAC scenario uh, uses, has used uh, member state inputs, but uh, the PAC scenario is way more ambitious at current or uh, previously presented at the time of building in 19, uh, 2019 than uh, national uh, energy and climate plans. I mean, we use them at the baseline also to start the, um, the building of the uh, energy supply and demand. Um, but of course, as Jörg explained, in order to follow uh, the pace, uh, at least for the energy system, uh, we needed to uh, have ambitions which are higher than the current, uh, the, the current uh, sum of the uh, national energy uh, and climate plans. Voila. Maybe Jörg could uh, complete uh, on, on it further, but I think this is, yeah. Reading. Yeah, looks like Jörg is fully happy with your answer. Uh, comment in between, between, there is a high ranking question, which is about transparency, open source, open data, etc. The PAC scenario is going to be open data. There will be a link on the web page. I don't know if we already have it, but if it's, if it's not there quite yet, it will come where you can access the data because it's meant to follow exactly this ambition that this type of work needs to be accessible, usable for everyone. The next high ranking question I have right now, and this one goes to Jörg again, is do you consider importing renewable hydrogen into Europe? Thanks for this question. Uh, indeed, this question was uh, discussed at previous scenario workshops with our members, with experts, with industry representatives. And uh, our position is that we do not include or assume any imports of any kind of hydrogen uh, from third countries beyond the European Union into the EU. Because we think that, first of all, it is the job of the European Union to cover uh, its own demand with own resources, to stick to uh, its commitments and uh, to try to reach uh, the targets that the EU committed to with own domestic resources. Our scenario shows that this is uh, feasible. It is possible. The technologies and the renewable energy potentials, they are there. They are available here within the European Union. However, of course, if um, a further detailed market assessment shows that imports uh, might uh, be more attractive. This could be possible 
in the mid or long term. This is a question that still needs to be considered and needs to be researched. For the time being, we did not include it. And of course, whenever it comes to imports, be it electricity, be it raw materials, be it hydrogen, uh, of course, sustainability criteria need to apply. We need to uh, really check in detail uh, to what extent uh, those imports from other countries do not harm the environment, do not harm, do not uh, add any harm to the planet and to the people, of course. Good. Last question to Jonathan, and I'm actually going to combine two questions. Uh, the question is on transport sector energy demand and whether the reduction that you assume actually includes the assumption that there will be changes in yeah, behavior. And I would like to combine this uh, with a question on options for citizen participation in the transition. Jonathan, last Thanks, question, last yeah. answer. Thanks, indeed. Uh, this, is, this is a very important question, uh, which as I said, goes even beyond transport as, um, is it only about how the energy supply or is it also about the adaptation of demand? So on transport to reply, uh, the transport sector uh, has been developed uh, using a lot of input, but especially uh, five studies from um, transport and environment and with inputs of the, of the stakeholders. To reply to this question, uh, there is a modal shift there is active mode in the PAC scenario, and there is also an increase in uh, efficiency of passenger by car. So increasing uh, the number of passenger by car uh, in the uh, via car pooling. Um, to go a bit, uh, this, is, this, is, this will be the only time I would be nerdy on this uh, on this panel, but we have a couple of numbers. We have 12% uh, of modal shift to active mode, for instance, especially for urban transport. Uh, and we have a, beyond 10% of increase, for instance, of passengers per car. Uh, we have a reduction in the freight um, growth due to circular economy, etc. There are. No, I think this is important still to, to, to remind that uh, the uh, PAC scenario indeed assumes a, a still a continuation of their services, which means that when we say less commuting, uh, we are keeping more or less, even with higher efficiencies, with more active mode, with modal shift, the same number of, of kilometers per passengers. Um, not, of course, uh, measures and policies to foster behavioral change are important and they need to be implemented and they are factored in the PAC scenario. But the data we had and also the philosophy that currently we have, uh, that of course could be, uh, could be further developed, was to say, we want as much as possible uh, to show the possibility of 100% renewable uh, while keeping the same level of activity. But of course, it is absolutely of utmost importance that we have policies for model shift for train, we have policies for increasing, decreasing the, um, the transport demand and decreasing the, um, the, 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 uh, also the, the overall uh, demand for energy services, but well, this is. I hope this this answered. But I think it's indeed. I mean, thanks for the question because it is a very important one. And thanks to the two of you, that was uh, super insightful, uh, very dense. And of course, we did not answer all the questions that came in. You perhaps have a chance, the audience, to still ask them in the second uh, Q and A round. Otherwise, don't hesitate to send questions to us. Contact data is online. Um, this entire consortium understands the PAC scenario as a living document. And I think it has become clear that there are many questions that still need to be answered. If you have comments and further views for us, we have established a feedback section on the PAC webpage. You can see now where this is. Um, go on this commentary function and let us know what you think after you have read through it. Um, we really understand this event and this launch as the beginning of a further exchange and not as the end of what has already been a very big piece of work. So help us to continue this exchange by leaving your comments, letting us know that you are interested to talk and we will definitely try to build upon all of this also in the future. 
And with this, we move on to the panel and I'm happy to introduce my panelists. Now, the first thing I need them to do is to turn on their videos, which I see is happening. One is missing. Ooh, he's there. Joachim Balke, I hear, is there. But yes, now I can also see him. Awesome. So, in order of appearance on my slide, Joachim Balke, Head of Unit at DG Energy, Rana Adib, Executive Director Rent21, Mark Foley, CEO of Eargrid, and welcome back, Laszlo Varro, Chief Economist of the IEA. You are all allowed for two minutes to comment on what you have just heard on the PAC scenario. Two minutes, really, please. We want to still have a conversation amongst you. We want to allow the audience to ask more questions. We start with Joachim and then go in the order of appearance of this slide. Joachim, the floor is yours. Well, hello, good morning uh, to everybody. And uh, can I thank very much um, to the organizers for having invited me and in particular for having organized this indeed very interesting uh, presentation this morning. I do apologize that I'm only connected with my mobile phone. Our corporate devices don't very much like Zoom, so I hope you can more or less hear or understand me. Um, I will then have to be very, very short, and I, I'll try to, to be that um, by saying that, first of all, your um, uh, scenario work and this event this morning is extremely timely. As, uh, as you know, we are in the middle of a process to revise the, uh, the 10E regulations, so our infrastructure policy, which indeed uh, has the overall and long-term objective uh, to make it contribute fully uh, to our objectives in terms of climate neutrality by mid-century, which is the cornerstone of the Green Deal. Uh, so this is the framework within which we are at present uh, in a stage of uh, consultation. Um, and this is, in fact, uh, in that sense, a very important element in gathering uh, an extremely broad uh, range of views on the different aspects of our infrastructure policy. Uh, this is a very useful input um, because it consolidates the views of, of civil society and NGOs in particular on the issue of infrastructure uh, planning, which informs then in turn our selection of PCIs, of our infrastructure uh, projects that we want to promote. Um, and we've had a number of interesting webinars over the last uh, three weeks, uh, during which this was also one of the key issues. And it's absolutely clear that um, if we want to have um, if we want to have infrastructure priorities which uh, are which we can implement in a timely fashion then these infrastructure priorities need to be defined in a process which is transparent inclusive and credible and at the beginning of this process um, indeed stands the selection of scenarios and it's in this sense that uh, your addition to this discussion of um, you know, what scenarios can we actually have to inform this infrastructure choice is a very valuable one. Um, as I said, we are in the process of, of selecting views. So um, it's, it's obviously not the point in time where you know, we, we will determine which are the right and the wrong ones. But what I can say is that um, definitely uh, it's good to have your view on the table as well as one which is very, very ambitious for sure, which also makes clear choices um, between options that you retain and others that you consider not relevant. I think for the purpose of clarity of the discussion, that is certainly helpful. Um, and uh, I think it's also very, very useful um, that uh, you have already in your work benefited from the cooperation, particularly with NSOE. Um, and that cooperation, I think, uh, with the network uh, operators and their associations is very, very valuable. Because indeed, uh, of course, one of the, um, for us, extremely interesting question would be uh, what follows from your specific scenario in terms of infrastructure needs? Uh, and here, since my two minutes are probably already over, let me just very, very briefly um, mention what for me would be the key takeaways from what I've heard so far. Um, clearly, um, number one, electrification. That's the top level trend in your scenario. Uh, that's not surprising and that mirrors also what is uh, a very, very important trend in our own scenarios that we've presented uh, in the context of the long-term strategy and that, as you know, we are now in the process of revising and updating. 
uh, we have that trend as well. You have it more pronounced and more quickly. So um, whatever you think of that, it's clear that um, we, have to, uh, we have to deduct from that. And it was mentioned very, very explicitly uh, also by um, uh, both by Claude Thomas and Laszlo Varro, I think that uh, this means uh, there is a need for more electricity infrastructure. I think it's good that this is, uh, this is, um, uh, this is a consensus view. Um, and um, this means infrastructure on different levels. It certainly also means a lot of local infrastructure, but it also includes what is the relevant dimension for the most relevant dimension, at least let's say for the 10E, um, transmission infrastructure with a cross-border dimension. So it's clear that uh, there are needs. The in investment probably needs to accelerate in this. Yeah, Achim, I have to cut you off. And I will now uh, come already to the conclusion. Um, if we want to make that happen, if we want this uh, investment to come forward, uh, what we need is very, very clearly, on the one hand, a clear regulatory framework, and on the other hand, we need public acceptance. That's what RGI stands for, and I think that's why this work is valuable, because ultimately there is a clear link between public acceptance on the one hand of constructing infrastructure and the planning process um, at, the, at the beginning, which stands at the beginning. Thank you. Sorry for being a bit too long. Thank you very much. Ice cream for all the others if you stick to the two minutes. We continue straight away with Rana. Hello, thank you very much. Um, yes, so first I would really like to congratulate uh, not only the partners, but um, I think the whole players who have participated in, uh, in elaborating basically um, the scenario, because I, I do think that the fact that I think, uh, Wendel, you had mentioned it, 150 experts have participated in developing the narrative around it, um, is something which really shows how solid it is and is also ultimately contributing to an acceptance of this. Um, I'll step back a bit. When we started uh, to discuss with Antonella Renton One's involvement uh, in the process, we were first a bit hesitant. And today, I really think it was a very good decision that we decided to join uh, basically um, this group. Um, we we're hesitant because we're a global network and not a European one. We we're hesitant because uh, we're not doing modeling and scenarios and uh, not so heavily involved in the planning, but rather focusing on policy and regulator frameworks, um, market developments from the renewable side. And I feel that uh, this is actually a real opportunity. So Europe is has a framework to move in a direction which is, I would say, like globally ambitious. Um, and I think we need, we have time constraints as a, and as a result, we really need to work on all leverages. Obviously, policy and regulatory frameworks are key here. Developing renewable energy um, uptake is also key. But I think that ultimately, we see very often that the discussion is not always looking into what is happening on the planning side. And scenarios are actually key here and determine the investment in renewable energy, in the infrastructure. They determine um, the planning of the infrastructure, obviously. They also give guidance on what is happening on the renewable, um, renewable uh, capacities which need to be built up. And um, I think this process is particularly interesting because it also brings players to the table who are normally not participating in such decision processes because they are not experts and modeling experts. So I think here there is a real interest in bringing basically players from civil society to something which is a key element in developing the strategy to 100% renewable energy uh, reality. Um, but also taking basically the outcomes here to feed this back again to players and increase the understanding that it's not only about building up uh, wind and PV, um, but also building up the infrastructure, that's one thing, but also that um, players who are supporting renewable energy need to participate in the whole scenario effort. So I think that is something which is important. What I think needs to happen as a next step, and we'll certainly discuss this, is to also take these results and inform and influence decision makers so that they can now step up and put in place the right regulatory frameworks and the ambition to also operationalize, I guess, what the scenario is telling us. And I think I'm ending here because we'll have more time for discussions later. Thank you, Rana. 
Mark, your chance for an ice cream. Two minutes. It's I'm going to make three points. Firstly, congratulations on an absolutely outstanding and seminal piece of work that has been carried out, out by the people. Um, sorry, I just have to lose my screen. Uh, so that's that my first point. Um, we mustn't waste time on superficial or academic debates about one target versus the other or who, whose target is better than the next. The maths are simple. And I think what you've set out today, if I may use the metaphor, is like having one currency or one language that everybody can understand, that everybody can relate to, and that speaks in a very explicit way to our achieving the Paris ambition, which is to contain global warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this is my first point. This is an outstanding piece of work. Secondly, the Irish experience. In Ireland last year, we launched one of the most ambitious national policy objectives in our 100 years as a sovereign state. And the core of that was a power system that could handle 70% renewables on average on the power system by 2030, twice what we were achieving in 2019. And you know, we just found out having formed a new government with the Greens at the centre stage of that government, it's not enough. It's only half what we need to do. So we're now setting about trying to establish what is the extra bit we need to do in order to achieve, to achieve those targets. Lastly, this is about leadership. Leaders, leaders in all walks of life must start to lead, must stand up and be counted, must show courage in the face of criticism and adversity, adversity and must commit to work together to deliver. I welcome this initiative. I encourage leaders to get behind this approach in a tangible and committed manner. And I'll have a, I'll have a magnum, please, Antina, as I'm on time. You will definitely get a magnum, Mark. <laughs> Thank you very much. And on to Laszlo. Thank you very much. So first of all, this is a very impressive, very high quality analysis. Uh, instead of picking on specific numbers, I would highlight some themes uh, which are common to the IA scenario analysis and has some important messages for governments. So first of all, uh, by total energy consumption declines, electricity generation strongly increases. And this is very important because this is a step change after more than a decade of stagnating European electricity generation. New renewable deployment will have to cover this growth and it will also have to replace the aging commercial generation, leading to an average annual deployment need of wind turbines and solar panels, which is significantly above the historical all time peak that Europe has ever achieved. Uh, so, so we'll need to have an investment policy that can make it happen. Uh, and we will need to have a licensing and regulatory frameworks that don't, st don't stop investment. Uh, the second is that the transportation sector and in industry, there is a significant role for hydrogen. Uh, so it's not purely 100% electrified on, uh, on, end, uh, on our final consumption level. Now, the sad fact is that as of today, around 97% of the hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels with an average emission level of 10 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of hydrogen. So we have been recommending uh, to Europe to put uh, the put a significant emphasis on ramping up electrolyzer manufacturing and electrolyzer deployment uh, as, uh, as part of the green stimulus efforts uh, because hydrogen will need to be very strongly uh, decarbonized uh, to, uh, to achieve this mission. And I'm not talking about ramping up electrolyzer capacity just a little bit. Uh, it will be 100 times, 200 times, 500 times the current level. And the third thing, uh, which is a common theme, is the importance of the building sector a very rapid transformation of building heating and building energy efficiency. We fully agree with that. Uh, this has very strong uh, potential benefits for job creation and economic development, but I should also warn that this is a very complicated sector, multiply non-market barriers, and these are 100 million buildings uh, uh, which are privately owned. So governments should put uh, building sector energy efficiency and, transfer and electrification policies at the, the heart of the economic recovery, but they should be also aware that this requires a very strong, very coordinated political effort. Thank you so much, Laszlo. I think that is an ice cream as well, not as big as Mark's. We welcome back uh, Wendel and Patrick, who are allowed one minute each max for a spontaneous reaction to whatever of what has been said you would like to react to. Do you want to go first, Wendel, and I'll go second? Or? Patrick, go ahead. 
Oh, I thought you were going to fun. Uh, yeah, I've got two points. Um, one is one is on the the policy side. Um, I just and one on the sort of philosophical side. Maybe I'll start with the philosophical side, because a number of people use the word that's globally ambitious. It's an ambitious ambition is a strange word because at one level it's exciting, it's courageous, it has agency, it has vision, but at the other level it people say, well, it's ambitious is a euphemism for it won't work, we won't get there. So I just like to underline that we should embrace the first part of the ambition. It is ambitious, uh, but it does give agency and vision. Uh, and courage and we need to do it with the 1.5 degrees of all the while being realistic about the challenges as mentioned uh, by Laszlo at the end on the building operators. On the policy side we do have now the recovery plan and the MFF and the PCIs which are mentioned and there's a whole swathe of different policy options which we'll get into later yep. but we need to use all of these um, to be able to realize them and they've picked up the speakers have picked up a range of a very important ones and the PCIs is is a critical one to get right because these then lock in emissions or lock in savings into the future so this will be a particular one to focus on I'll stop there so I can get maybe a mini magnum ja ja ich glaube wir sind da mit capex und opex auf dem auf dem falschen weg so someone's ja, also talking in the wrong language and like not part of my channel list kilometer you kabel and on to wendel Okay, good. Um, I, I have not much to add to Patrick. I mean, I heard a lot of positive comments in particular about the kind of the coherence of, um, of the proposal. And I think that is exactly one of the challenges that we have, of course, when we're working within the European Union, because coherence is not always the um, strongest uh, element of our union. And I think there, um, of course, the challenge is that from now on, the decisions that are being made should have in mind how do we tackle the climate crisis and that goes for the whole debate around the future eu budget and the recovery fund but that also goes for very specific debates such as the one that is currently taking place on the just transition fund and just transition transition mechanism i mean if europe cannot ensure that the just transition mechanism does no longer fund fossil fuels then of course the coherence of our policies are to be questioned Thank you so much, all of you. Bit of panel housekeeping. We again take questions via poll everywhere. You help us if you ask who you want to ask. Antonella joins us as a question facilitator. Antonella, turn on your video again. I cannot see you. I may be in the wrong screen though. Also, Joachim, please come back to us with your video turned on. Panelists, ideally you mute and unmute yourselves, otherwise it gets really chaotic. I also suggest that you raise a physical hand um, if you say, now I want to say something. And we even try that you are allowed to interrupt each other politely, let's put it like this. And of course, straight to the point in your answers, uh, we are a bit behind time. Mark will have to leave punctually, perhaps then we add a little bit more of questions and answers, we'll decide when we are there. And um, I think I uh, ask Antonella if she has a first question for us. Yes, I do have a question, and this is actually for last law. Um, the IAA is going to have a special focus on Europe and Greece in the next outlook, 2020. And so the question is whether you are going to consider a very high risk scenarios for your publication. Thank you. So, uh, uh, in fact, let me just advertise uh, that uh, uh, we are going to launch on the 2nd of July the new energy technology perspectives, which will map uh, the transition to a zero carbon energy system. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it will have very high shares of renewables. Uh, now, we, we, also have, uh, uh, we also have made uh, uh, analysis of low nuclear pathways low carbon capture and storage pathways because we understand uh, that those other low carbon technologies face uh, significant social and political barriers uh, and we also we, we always came to the conclusion that those very high renewable share pathways are possible they can be done but they have there are non-trivial obstacles that have to be overcome super so i have a second question can i ask one <laughs> Let's, let's see if any of the panelists wants to say something on what uh, Laszlo has just said. If this is the case, go like this. Otherwise, next audience question straight on from Antonella. 
So um, one that received a lot of uh, um, points is what is the role of flexibility in a system largely based on renewable? And I would like to combine with another one, which says, how do you specifically ask in uh, uh, Mark, how are you going to plan and deliver a system with much higher shares of an electricity demand also due to the data centers that are very popular in your country. I think these two questions can go together. So I will start with Mark, but then also ask the other uh, panelists to um, express an opinion about the flexibility required. I mean, the short, the, the two comments. One, first thing is you're correct. Ireland is in a unique position whereby it's going to experience very significant electricity growth in the next decade, 30% plus, mainly due to data centers. Then on top of that, we have to deliver a massively decarbonized power system. How are we going to do it? We're a long way on the journey. Last weekend, on Sunday, I believe, we had 65% renewables on the power system, and we averaged 48% in January, February, and March. Now, the curve gets steeper, and the challenge gets great, greater. But how we're going to do it is by leveraging what we've done to date, number one, in terms of our expertise. Secondly, we're out to the market to, to find global partners who will work with us. The notion of partnership is center stage in our, tra in our strategy. I don't doubt the combination of our expertise and some of the best brains in the world, when put together, will get us to our journey, which, just to summarize, is 70% on average on the power system in 2030, which will mean that the system last Sunday, in 10 years' time, would have been operating at close to 100% renewables. We're on the journey, we're well advanced, and with partnership, we'll get there. Thank you very much, Mark. I have a question to Rana. Rana, you just said before you represent a network that is not European but international um, and a very wild mixture of different institutions. From your perspective, to which extent does it make sense to develop such a scenario for Europe? And where do you say actually what we are trying to tackle is Europe and the rest of the world and we need to do something else? Thank you, Tina. Uh, thanks, Tina. Um, so I, I do think that obviously at the European level it makes a lot of sense. Um, today we cannot speak about uh, moving this to a global scenario. I think the global scenario in terms of the, the grids is just not a reality. Um, so there is the national level and the regional level which uh, plays a role here. From what we see, however, and I think this is where the approach is really important. Even though we're talking here about a European approach and a European scenario, um, it's very instructive on the process and what needs to happen not only at the European level, but in many other regions. It's very clear that when we're talking about the electrification and renewable developments um, and uh, the grid developments, we need to um, work on all flexibility options and interconnections grids um, at all levels, I think, are key with regard to this. And we also see that um, there are similar processes in Latin America, um, in Australia, um, in Southeast Asia, and they are starting to, to speak about the role of interconnected grids. And I think here it is really key to learn from uh, what comes, um, let's see, to learn what is happening at the European level and uh, bring this experience uh, to, to other regional processes. And I think Mark spoke about partnerships here. I think it's very clear that partnerships are also important because ultimately we're talking about Europe, but climate change is global. And as a result, we need to move to a 100% decarbonized energy system. And I'm really insisting on the energy system because here we're talking about the grids and electricity plays obviously a key role, but we clearly see that when we're looking into heating and cooling and transport, we're really not there yet. And uh, these are the sectors where we need to ramp up. So I feel that um, the European discussion needs to be replicated at other regional levels but connect to, connect it to a global target, uh, which is the Paris Agreement. Very see briefly, ahead. very briefly, very Europe, briefly, Mark. <laughs> Europe should seek to be a beacon for the world, and we have the opportunity. Mm -hmm.
That is a great statement. Mm. You should uh, find a way to still, no, I'm not going to say this, otherwise my communication department kills me, but I was going to say we should integrate it still in the press release. Antonella had an, no, Rana, do you want to respond? Just, just one, because I think this is really an interesting point, and I also feel, I forgot to underline before what I really liked about the scenario, and I think that is something which is important. It builds on renewable energy, it builds on energy saving and efficiency, um, and it also builds on the rapid phase out of fossil fuel and does not include bridging technologies with CCS. And I think this should also be uh, the European ambition in guiding the way. Thank you so much. Antonella, you had a question from the audience. Yes, and a remark, because I think it also bridges on collaboration, which is very much needed. I have a question, actually, two questions that are both addressed to Joachim Balke. One is, uh, they can be combined. Um, what should the EU do to actually have a 100% renewable scenario modeled, which are the countries, the member states, I believe, that should support such a request, and what is the role of the regulator? So it's a quite a package. But then the other question is, what about public acceptance? And for the energy transition and the infrastructure that is needed, so also power lines and grids, to actually make it possible. And where have you seen the biggest mistakes that have been done that have prevented this? I, I think that the other then can also chip in. Joachim. Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me and uh, see me. Yes. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll try to reply at least to, to some of those, not all of those, uh, not to forego my last chances for an ice cream. So on the modeling, um, I think what I can say is that um, we are indeed at, at the moment um, <clears throat> uh, updating the modeling that we did for the long-term strategy. Um, uh, here, the main point is indeed um, not to look at the, uh, at the com compatibility with Paris as such in 2050, which was already there in some of the scenarios of the long-term strategy, but to look at the pathway, uh, how to get there. And this, I think, also links then to, to an answer that Jonathan gave earlier on, on where the differences are. I think they're mainly in the pathways. So here we're looking indeed then at where we have to be in 2030. Um, and uh, how we can be uh, more ambitious um, already in 2030 in line with what uh, what the president uh, said to go for 50 or potentially 55 percent and we will of course look indeed as we've done in the past uh, into a whole range of combination of possible technologies which will allow us to have that steeper trajectory as it were so that's the um, that's the modeling exercise which is going on at the moment. It's of course true that uh, you have member states uh, coming from from vastly different backgrounds and with vastly different interests. Um, and somehow, of course, we do have to try and capture also the variety which which is out there. Um, I would like perhaps to um, uh, perhaps not so much go into the question on the regulators. I mean, they do have an important role, but, but they're not here today. So. Maybe that's not uh, not the panel to discuss their role in in depth, but rather to come back to this question of public acceptance, which you mentioned, uh, Antonella, because I think that's indeed the key one, and that's I think um, the uh, the key element for me from this discussion, that um, it's clear from your scenarios that additional infrastructure is needed because I mean public acceptance of infrastructure, I think, is the uh, of transmission infrastructure is really the big, the big element. Um, but uh, we do have to come to a system which allows us to define the priorities um, in that kind of transparent and inclusive manner that people understand um, that the infrastructure priorities are necessary to realize the societal vision, which is ultimately behind the scenarios. And I think that's, that's where it starts. And um, I think we're happy to continue the, uh, the continuation um, of the good cooperation amongst others with IGI on, on that matter, because I think it's absolutely key if we want to realize this, uh, these ambitions, which indeed, uh, as Laszlo has said, uh, require an awful lot of more electricity generation. 
and and we have to be clear about that that also means um, a lot of additional investment and it means uh, a lot of additional infrastructure um, for which we need ultimately this public acceptance laszlo very briefly because mark has to leave as punctual as the ice cream you know is going yes. to be so so from a, from an analytical point of view, it is certainly possible to design a 100% renewable scenario. It's very enjoyable uh, to do that from an intellectual point of view. Uh, so, uh, I think what we need to have is more structured discussion about the social uh, and economic and political impacts of the various possible 100% renewable scenarios because they can be very different. So questions like, uh, um, do you want to change your lifestyle and buy from the local farmers or do we need renewable hydrogen to, power, to transport Portuguese strawberries to Brussels? Uh, or uh, do you want uh, uh, very difficult seasonal storage problems with solar or do you willing to, are you willing to accept much more wind turbines in the countryside? Uh, these are not analytical questions. These are primarily social and political questions. Uh, and I think we need to have a more structured debate uh, in Europe about the non-purely energy aspects of the energy transition. Thank you very much. Rana, I see your hand, but I know that Mark has to leave very punctually. So Mark, if you would like to have a last comment, someone Thanks. in this office poked me and said he hasn't really talked enough about flexibility yet either. If you could say something about flexibility. Yeah, I was, the two points I was going to make, and then maybe I'll mention flexibility, and what, the, the, the issue of winning hearts and minds is, is, is absolutely central to this whole whole debate and I what I like about the work that's been done is to the ordinary person this is all a lot of noise by painting a picture of the future in the way you're doing you're creating a platform to communicate with people so that they understand the future and maybe we can get them on board and to understand that my second point is really really important the COVID-19 experience that we have all been through. We have seen government, governments in action and communicating in a way they've never done before and bringing whole populations with them and signing up to the most restrictive of uh, restrictions on their lives, which many people thought would never, never happen. And it's happened with the, uh, the ascent of people and they've got behind it. Can we not do the same about the climate challenge with this, this picture of the future and, and get people together? On the, the question of flexibility, of course, flexibility is central to what I call a whole basket of elements that allow a power system ultimately to work at close to 100%. It's one of the central elements. Renewables technology is another element. Batteries is another element. There is, there is, no, there is no silver bullet here. It's this holistic bringing together of a whole range of technologies and solutions that make a power system, the power system of the future work. So I'll finish on that and say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to participate. The work is simply fantastic and I look forward to supporting it in a very tangible way as best I can into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And it was sorry great to, to have you on this panel. I, I have to go and talk about the Celtic Interconnector in another panel in five minutes. Thank you and God bless. I hope they give you ice cream. Thanks. I hope so. <laughs> I could see Rana's hand raised. I can see Antonella waves more audience questions. I would say we add a little bit of time knowing that we will run a little bit over time, but I don't want to cut this off quite yet. I hope this is okay for everyone. Um, Rana, is your comment still relevant or do we let uh, Antonella have the next audience question? You need to unmute yourself. Yes? Yes. Okay. It's good. Um, yes. I, I'll be super brief, Antonella. So um, I think, yes, indeed, public acceptance is super important. Uh, we just published the Renewables Global States Report with a special feature on how to build public support for renewables. And I think there are different leverages here. We speak about social political acceptance, about market acceptance and community acceptance. And I just think here it's important to, um, as Mark said, like picture the or paint the vision i think that's really important communicate it in a good way that it's understandable and also relevant to all decision makers that's another part um but the other part is also policy can also drive this i think especially in a situation of economic stress of um job stress uh, now in COVID times um it is very clear that showing players how 
this transition can also contribute to creating local jobs is super important and making them be part of the economic business case of uh, the renewable energy transition. And that is something where governments really have a responsibility to. And the other part, I think, just to build on what Mark said on the COVID part, I think governments have shown leadership. They need to show the same leadership for the climate part. And this means, unfortunately, sometimes that we don't have a win-win situation. And um, that's also courage uh, leaders uh, need to step up to. Thank you, Rana. Antonella, last audience question. Um, yes, I think it is. Um, I would like to have two questions. One didn't get so many uh, heads up, but it's an interesting question, and they can be combined both for Patrick and Benden. Um, one question is what was uh, what has been Ensoi reaction to the tax scenario so far, and the other is. Um, uh, are your NGOs members going to accept uh, the grades and the wind that is necessary to realize the PAC objectives? Um, Shall I start? Um, with, with the second one, um, obviously, um, it's not because our members um, are all standing behind the PAC scenario, that this means that we will support any kind of infrastructure and any kind of wind development. Um, there are uh, sustainability concerns and the question is really how can we ensure that we increase um, infrastructure as well as production capacity where that is needed, but within um, the best possible solutions in terms of sustainability, both for its impact on people as well as on nature. And I think there are many examples of how that can be done. For instance, if we refer to the issue of the expansion of offshore wind, which will be an important part, um, there is the example, for instance, in Belgium, where uh, wind developers and um, NGOs, including conservation NGOs, have developed a joint position on where kind of where the infrastructure needs to be based within the Belgian part of the North Sea. So there are perfectly um, examples, and I think RGI in itself is an example of how NGOs and uh, TSOs can work together. So um, it's not a blank check, but definitely there's a recognition that if we want to solve the climate crisis, then there's a number of measures that need to be taken. Um, on the on the first part, um, there of course has not been an official NSUI reaction, and I think it would probably be better to ask for NSUI um, how they um, how they react to the the PAC scenario as such. But we have had um, participation um, and um, very intense communication with NSUI on this scenario. So there definitely is an interest from their side for what we've been doing, um, but whether they will include um, something like the PAC scenario in future um, storylines and so on, that um, would be something that NSUI would need to reply to. Rick, would you like to add to this? Sure, just I'd like to, I mean, I think Mendel said everything on the first point, on the, um, the second point with respect to the NGO supporting it. I think the key thing here is, is, is trying to avoid uh, any unnecessary trade-offs. Um, the clear thing is using the SEA and the IA, the Environmental Impact Assessment Directives, and applying them properly for, for both land-based and ocean-based renewables um, and, and the grid. Um, and that's quite essential because we don't want to undermine the birds and habitats directive um, through it. And the SEA and the AA have been relatively mixed, um, um, applied at mixed levels. So I think it really requires quite a lot of effort to make sure that those are applied properly. And also in the marine area, the placement is, is hugely important with respect to frag fragile ecosystems. And there has to be, again, the AA and SEA and then the respect of the marine strategy framework directive. So again, as long as there's coherence, planning, collaboration, uh, and, and doing it in the right place, I think we can, uh, I think there can be avoiding the loss, the, the trade-offs, and we can progress together. Super. Thanks a lot. We wanted this to be a concise, to-the-point event, and therefore we end the panel here with a last round of comments allowed to, in this order, Laszlo, Rana, and Joachim, and this time it's one minute. Laszlo. Your last comment, I would love to hear something about IEA's future role in making a scenario like this happen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so 
Uh, I already mentioned the energy technology perspectives, which is coming out, and uh, I'm also very pleased that somebody in the audience was actually aware of uh, our future work uh, on electricity networks. Uh, we indeed, uh, we are actually concerned about the lack of policy attention and the lack of, lack of strategic focus on the electricity infrastructure, as, uh, as we want to put uh, this conversation very firmly on the, on the table. Uh, we are also uh, is, uh, busily working uh, on assessing electricity security uh, so because I very much uh, agree and I think we should also recognize uh, that European transmission system operators, including uh, Elia, uh, who joined us today, made a fantastic job in pushing the boundaries uh, of high levels of renewable integration. Uh, China is dominant in manufacturing the hardware, building the solar panels, but European system operators, uh, operators have been leading the development of the software for the clean energy system. And this Europe has a global leadership role in this. Having said that, we also think that our robust uh, and uh, maintenance of reliability is an absolutely key precondition for the social and political viability of the energy transition. So in October, we are going to launch a major report uh, on uh, electricity security during the transition. And unsurprisingly, that will have a strong focus on both grids and also providing flexibility for the power system, as well as the new power uh, electronics in innovation that will be needed. Thanks a lot. A lot of interesting things ahead of us coming from IEA. Rana, your last comment, uh, contribution of REN21 in the future to all of this. Unmute yourself. Yes. Um, what is very clear is that uh, from our side we will use this uh, process and um, yeah, first experience also to communicate globally about the importance of ambitious scenario development and the role it plays in the overall energy system transformation, I guess. Um, the other part is to also link it to the policy debate and I just think with regard to this what seems important is to underline again the tension we don't have a lot of time so there is obviously a need to build support for this there is a need to um, have the infrastructure there is a need to invest in um, energy generation capacity and um, this requires support for efficiency renewables infrastructure but it also requires a political um, orientation that we stop using and producing fossil fuel because otherwise we will not reach basically um our vision of an efficient and renewable based energy system in 10 years time not 10 years time but i think uh, to reach uh, the paris agreement thank you rana and last comment from joachim one minute please sorry um <clears throat> yeah just very briefly so um on the issue of flexibility, I just wanted to add one uh, term, basically, which maybe hasn't been used yet. And this is uh, system integration, because I think for us, this is going forward, uh, the big topic, how we can bring the necessary flexibility uh, to the system by linking the electricity system more closely to, um, to the heating system, transport, and also others. And that's uh, what we're looking at now in the European Commission, um, first in terms of communication, and then later on probably also in terms of legislative implementation. I think in that context also, uh, we perhaps need to have a more in-depth discussion on the role of hydrogen. I think we've discussed electricity today, and it's good that we have consensus, but I think it would be also helpful um, to, uh, to intensify a little bit the discussion on the future role of hydrogen that, uh, that we see, in particular in the context of system integration. Um, uh, because I think also in your scenarios, the way I understand it, it does play a significant role. Um, and then lastly, just to reiterate, uh, as I said, we are looking into reviewing the 10E regulation. A lot of um, speakers today have emphasized the importance of making PCIs uh, key tools in this uh, clean energy transition and then realizing the objectives. We are determined to come forward with a, uh, with a 10E review, which will ensure this is going to happen. Thanks very much. Thanks to you, Joachim, indeed. Uh, a lot also at EU level going on that is highly exciting, highly relevant. I am meant to share my screen again because we now move on once more to Patrick and uh, Wendel who are going to share their thoughts on how can the PAC 
help policy making and how can policy help realize the pact, which of course fits nicely with the, our last comment. Patrick, yes. I believe this time yeah. You start. Um, exactly. Yeah. So thanks very much. So, I mean, there's two questions. How can the PAC help policymaking and how can policymaking help realize the PAC? So if I just go to the next slide, please. Um, the arrow one. Yeah, you got it. Okay, fine. Um, so what we've tried to do here, and I won't do all the details, is develop a bit of an arrow of time on the top of the greens and blues are basically the different policy windows of opportunity. And we've already talked about, you know, the wider Green Deal and the recovery package in MFF. But in the next two years, there's a range of different windows of opportunity for change. And the bottom, we've put down the range of different asks or needs that we've identified in the PAC scenario. I won't go through all of them, obviously, but we've got the hydrogen strategy coming up, the renovation wave we've mentioned, we've mentioned the 10E regulation, um, the renewable energy directive comes up, so here we want 50% renewables by 2030, we haven't met mentioned that yet under the forest strategy uh, our suggestion is to is to uh, is to have a reduction of two-thirds of biomass under the renovation wave we think through the major renovation of buildings you should move towards one-third um, energy use by by 2050 we've already mentioned offshore wind um, and so on and so forth so what we've tried to do here is to say in the next two years where can what uh, window of opportunity be used? It's not the full and end of, end of the full story because there's of course a lot more. Um, and so anyway, so what we're very keen on as well is afterwards, if you have your own visions as to what windows of opportunity there are and how we can fit in, we'd like to hear from you. In terms of our ways forward, I've uh, got five main messages. One is put your money where it matters. So this is the recovery package in MFF. Um, we've mentioned the, uh, the PCIs, but also use the taxonomy to remove harmful subsidies. As, as, uh, that's quite important. You can have a, a green taxonomy, brown taxonomy, but make sure it's focused on the right things. The second, and I think many people have already mentioned that, is we need to act now. These are the times to change. We need to use each of the windows and opportunity. There's no silver bullet. So, for example, engage in the forest strategy to guide biomass use that respects the environment. There's, of course, different interests, but if we focus on sustainability, then those interests can be positive. We obviously need to stop funding fossil fuels because they'll link in future emissions and can be costly and beware of the risks of fossil hydrogen and CCS because there's promises of fossil hydrogen um, but it's often linked to CCS and the, the questions there is how viable that is either environmentally uh, or in terms of cost effectively. To make this whole thing work we actually need to get the economics right so we need to reform economic incentives that's carbon taxes, subsidy reform, ETS reform. There's a range of different um, initiatives being taken within the within the umbrella of the Green Deal. So we need to make those happen. This is not just at the European level, but we've also seen that Netherlands is going to is committing to a new uh, carbon tax. Germany is discussing ETS reform. So a lot has to happen at the member state level, and then engage all stakeholders. You need all stakeholders to make a difference. Uh, policymakers, the ENSOs, the CSOs to engage with the PAC scenario to make it a reality. And it gets down as people mentioned a lot of pub, uh, local level issues and engagement is needed whether it's on buildings or, or transmission grids or local grids so what we're going to do in the next steps of this project is going to pull together a bit of a vision um, ourselves with can europe develop a policy brief saying how can we realize this what are the windows of opportunity what are the policy needs and what are the recommendations and in that context we very much uh, listen to a di uh, look forward to a dialogue and ideas from this wider group and the panelists have, and the speakers have given some useful examples already. And I'll now hand over to, to Vendel for some additional insights. Thank you. I will be extremely brief. I think this, uh, this is already extremely comprehensive. I think for me, uh, the main additional message um, is that we need to be clear in defining where we want to go to. I think that is really um, something that is extremely important for the coming months. We need the EU to clearly translate what does the Paris Agreement commitments really mean for where Europe will want to go. And we have an important debate around the 2030 climate target coming up um, uh, relatively recently. And so once we have clearly identified the ambition, then we need to ensure that we have all the policies in place to 
targets to target setting, of course, implementation is extremely important. And there it's very clear that we need both very specific pieces of legislation that tackle specific uh, challenges, um, such as um, reducing energy demand and increasing renewables, etc. But we also need horizontal policies. Climate change is a horizontal uh, or needs a horizontal approach. And so we need to ensure that trade and tax policies, et cetera, et cetera, are in line with the objectives that we set. Thank you. Thanks to the two of you for this uh, great overview. Reminder to the audience, we have a comment function on the web page. And uh, as just mentioned, there's going to be a policy brief. Your comments may be an interesting input in the development of this document. Antonella, come back. You were already there because now we want to hear your views on the future of this entire project and how and why we need to continue this. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we need to continue this. Uh, we have published uh, a small report. You find it on the web page uh, where it highlights some next steps and open questions of the PAC scenario. But apart from that, I want to say that the PAC project has been an incredible learning process for all of us that have been involved in that and all the others that somehow had to uh, catch up with our wishes of exploring new pathways. Uh, in particular, I think it is important to stress the fact that without the support of the German Ministry for Economic um, uh, would have not been possible to have this uh, work done and we hope that they will continue to support it so that we can um, go into the next round. Essentially, the future, uh, it's, um, we need to design it together. The energy transition, it's never only a, a technological question. It's most and first of all a societal endeavor and if we construct it together we have a much solid base for making the right decisions. Having a collaborative effort like the PAC scenario only enable us to make better decisions. So I really hope that uh, NCOE will continue to work with us in a very constructive way as it has been done for the past two years. Uh, we will reinforce, obviously, our effort to, to have the same level of engagement with the ENSOC. But also we need many more sectors because if we want to decarbonize the entire economy, we need much more than just electricity and gas. And for this, I invite everybody to come to us to support the request to make pressure into the national government to talk with regulators and really make the re energy regulators also the leaders in enabling the energy transition by uh, embracing a very ambitious future. Thanks a lot to the team that uh, has done a huge amount of work to realize this event and all the content that has been generated and of course the participants. Let's give back the word to Antina. She has all the details. Antina, you are muted. Antina, you are muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. Look, at the very end, I was so good throughout. Via the news section of the PAC Scenario webpage, you can access this event page and there you will find the links to all the materials, documents, analysis, the request, etc. Everything has, that has been mentioned here. And other than this, big thank you to all speakers, to the audience, your questions, excellent special thanks to my colleagues, Liam, Steffi, Lizzie, who have had a lot of work in the background. Um, and to all of you, have a good day and goodbye and be with us in the future and leave your comments on the web page.